action. So when we we was just having a chat with Paul Williams, um, and he brought up the common objection of why Jesus did not know the hour. He ran. Hold that, please, mate. Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. Deceitfully, he ran from the the, uh, the points I was making. So, reason being, I'm making this is because we need to expose the wolves for what they are. Jesus says in Matthew 7:15, "Be aware of wolves in sheep clothing." So we need to rip off the clothing of the sheep, of the of them, in order to establish who they really are. What I'm saying is, in the word for knows is oiden, which doesn't necessarily mean that he does not know. Paul Williams happily claimed that the word does not mean to bring forth or to declare. He said that the word only means to know. He said that he appealed to authority and said that he was someone that knows the Greek when in reality he didn't even know what the word oiden meant. But what I'm, what I'm establishing in here is in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, the word is also used where Paul is saying that he didn't bring everything forth about just everything in general, but he brought forth about the uh, crucifixion of Jesus. So we know that Jesus did know all things. If we go to John 21, 17, we do that now quickly before we get on to your questions because his, yeah, his brother wanted some questions. But this is after Jesus. This is after Jesus' ascension and he comes to comes to Peter and he says, He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. If you know all things, the word all there isn't specific. It encompasses everything. So if we take that verse in isolation, it might presume, it might mean that he did, genuinely did not know the hour. But if we encompass the whole Bible, which Paul Williams did not want to do, he didn't even want to talk about the Quran. If we encompass the whole Bible, we already established, it says it in Matthew as well. It establishes in Matthew that Jesus knew all things before the fact that there was the hour to be declared verse. So if we know that Jesus already knows all things, we can use that word in coordinates with that belief rather than that he genuinely didn't know the hour. But anyway, what was your question? Yeah, I've got quite a few. So. That's right. I'll start with the basic ones. Um, do you think hell is kind of annihilatory or infinite, eternal? No, eternal or yeah, so you would get a lot of mixed views with this. Yeah. Um, but we know that Jesus speaks a lot about hell. And he, and he mentions hell and says there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Whether or not it's a continuation or there's some, seem, there's some part where it just cease to exist and you perish in mm. the dirt, it doesn't actually matter. Like, if it means one or the other, one, you're either in hellfire for eternity, which is completely awful, or you just cease to exist, which is the last thing you want as well. Mm. The best possible way we can interpret it is, no matter what, you're going to be in a world of hurt. So what you need to focus on is not what hell is like, but what the kingdom of heaven is like. And that's the, it's, that's the, vote, that's the focus point, not, not hell. We should rather talk about what heaven is like and how we should be working towards salvation, how we should be working towards the kingdom of heaven rather than talk about hell. Hell should not be a focal point. It should not be what we should mm. like, know whether what happens in hell. We just know that it's a separation from God. Mm. And that by definition is horrible. If you're separated from God, that in itself is hell. So if, you're, yes. if you perish, you're in hell. If you're actually physically in hell, you're in hell because you cease to be with the Father. Do you think we choose to, to be separate from God? Absolutely, yeah. So, the with with God, God is all loving, but He's also just. God is like this is the thing with with Christians, and we need to take this into consideration. God is all loving, and we have already established that. We don't need to talk about that. But God is also just, and in order to genuinely receive a gift, and in order to be just, someone needs to hold their hand out. You can't force a gift down someone's throat; otherwise, it's not a gift. Gift is the eternal life. And if we don't hold our hands out and accept the gift, which is Jesus, the fact that he died on the cross, then it's not a gift. We need to accept it with open arms. Otherwise, God will just leave us to our own devices to do our own thing. Otherwise, he wouldn't be just. He'd be a, it would be his puppets. He's not a puppeteer. He's not a puppeteer. He doesn't judge everything we do in a sense where he, not, like, he points to us, we need to do that, we need to do this. Of course, we should do the will of God but we are not robots and we're not puppets of God. We have free will. And we have free will to choose the fact that we were with him within a, in, a, in eternity. Do you think it's possible to be saved without kind of knowing Christ? 
this is a good one. So in in, J in James 5, I think it's James 5, I could be wrong. I used this as an example uh, on another okay. um, video, but I'll touch up on it again. If we use the analogy of a tribesman in the jungle, never picked this book up in his life, he's never heard of Christ, doesn't even know the concept of God, Ju uh, God will judge them on how they perceive the world. So meaning, say for example with autism, they might perceive the world different from someone who does not have autism, and that is a tip, um, that has a, a, a different function that they do, right? The reason why I say this is because every single person is living a different life. That person in the jungle has never seen God, but he will judge them within their perspective of life, not how the Bible does in a sense where of course, it will be judged in accordance with the teachings of the Bible, but not in the same way as we will, because we have more knowledge than him. The more you grow, the more impact that sin has on you. The more knowledge you have of this Bible, this is, why, this is what I say to people, the more you study the Bible, the more you better follow the will of God, because you will you'll be judged more because you understand more. Whereas that person in the jungle will be judged, don't get me wrong, but very, very differently to me and you. So, you think it's possible then? Absolutely, I think. Yeah. Every, everything's possible with God. It's because uh, the law is written on our hearts, would you say? In what way? As in, let me find Romans 2. Or I think oh, Romans 2, yeah. Yeah. It describes how even the Gentiles love the law to be saved because the law written on their hearts along those lines. Yeah, I mean, it all depend. It all genuinely depends on how they perceive the world. Like, and I, I need to stress that because you might be, you might have been brought up in a horrible household. You might have been brought up in a horrible household that is Christian. Let's use that as an example. And there's been awful times within the church that, that you went to. Um, something's happened that has pulled you away from Christ. Just because that has happened doesn't necessarily mean that your perception of that will be judged the same as mine. So if there's a Gentile, me and you are Gentiles, yep. we see the gospel for how it is written. The Jews, however, they perceive the Torah very, different to, very differently as to what we do, but they will be judged according to what they know rather than what they don't know. If they have no exposure to the gospel whatsoever and they're confined in this box, who knows? I'm not God. Okay, yeah, that's I don't know. God might judge them in a way where I'm not even going to, I don't even want to use an analogy where he might say, okay, they, they would be saved because we just don't know. But we know that God, we definitely know that God, because it speaks about it in the Bible, we know that God judges them according to their, their surroundings and how they perceive the world. And that, 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 that's actually that's actually associated with um, why Jesus went to Hades. Those before him who did not know Christ, if they would have known Christ and they would have believed, because he, God knows more than we can ever comprehend. So the whole of Romans 4, it talks about Abraham's faith and all the other prophets. And if you drew, if genuinely meditate on Hebrews 4, it talks about how all the prophets were saved through their faith, but through their faith was also their acts upon their faith. Meaning Abraham, he was told to sacrifice his son, right? Yeah. What did he do? He put him there. Yeah. And he was genuinely willing to sacrifice his son until, boom, God, God showed, showed himself and was like, no, you don't need the to do it no more. The ram, exactly. So if they are before us, and they've showed genuine faith of the will of God, then there is no, no way, shape or form that they can't be saved. So it depends, on, it depends upon perception. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, the, yeah. that's the one line all you need to say is, depends on their perception of the world. How about when people say, this is probably something that comes up a lot, but how, how could God give an infinite punishment to something finite? Again, it, it alludes. <laughs> It, it leads back to 
what we said earlier about how it's a gift. Yeah. Like, I, but God puts us on this earth at the perfect time for us, for our salvation. So we're on this earth, this time here and now is perfect for my salvation to turn to Christ. Perfect for his, perfect for his and perfect for yours. So if I'm not, if I'm going through all of what I'm going through and I've not accepted Christ, even though he's gave me the perfect earth to live in and the perfect um, time frame to live in, in order to accept him, how can I, how can I just say to myself, well, that's not fair. We can't say it's not fair if you've not accepted what he's offered to you. Again, it alludes to it again. It's a gift. You open your arms out. God is God is love, but he's also just. So it's not it's not God that sends us. We send ourselves. Can I go back to Old Testament prophecy? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Because initially, like this is something that kind of helped bring me to the faith. You know, yeah. Messianic prophecy. Let's see if I can go around. Right. What's it? What's it roughly speaking? Mike, Mike, five. No, no Mike, five. Day nine six. Sorry. Isaiah, nine, so, yeah. To us, a child is born. Yes. Yeah. And Prince of Peace. Yeah. Almighty, Almighty God. God. Yeah. El Gibor. It, it, it calls him Eternal Father as well. Yeah. Let me find. How, how could we call Christ Eternal Father? Yeah. So you might be able to find a verse, but I. I don't. Yeah. I, it's fine. I can just use it. Okay. Off. Yeah. So when it says He's um, Everlasting Father, it doesn't act necessarily. It doesn't mean that we not necessarily. It doesn't mean that He is the Father. Uh, it, in in the Hebrew, it literally means father of eternity yeah. which actually proves our point as christians even more because it proves that he is eternal so it doesn't mean that he is the father is the father and he's like the father of the eternal father it means that he's the father of eternity he embodies eternity so he's the father of that if you're the father of something you're the leader of it so he's the leader of eternity meaning he possesses eternity so it's not that he's the father yeah. because i was talking to a quranist messianic jew gospel it's this guy and I was showing him this verse and he was telling me that it can't be about, about Jesus because it was in the eternal father. That, but, yeah, just, yeah, yeah, that's, that's why. Meant, yeah. But like in Isaiah 9, 6, uh, if, if we actually, let, let's go to it. I would flip it on them and I would say to them, if Jesus is, if, if you accept, because they've accepted that it, it could potentially be Jesus, which is a good start. But if they've said that it's not Jesus because it is the father, but you show this evidence, I would then go and say to them, well, if Jesus is saying, if, if Jesus is being called wonderful counselor, the mighty God, they have no right to say that Jesus is not being called God. Because literally in the next chapter of Isaiah, in Isaiah 10, 21, I believe, it says the remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob unto the mighty God. The word there is El Gibor, which is given to Jesus as well as Yahweh which proves our point even more that Jesus is Yahweh. There's multiple verses that prove Jesus is Yahweh, but that's one just to establish there. Yeah, that's good because that's, that's what I, I, I try to use. The... What you need to do, if I don't know if you want to get into like like apologetics. and In a couple of years. In a couple of years, yeah, good. Bro, that's the best thing you can do. This is what I done. I was lurking on the, sh I, this is what I give, right? This is what I say to people. I lurked in the shadows. I was watching other people, didn't engage as much, but I, meditated on the word in its entirety until you feel like you get to a point where you've got a good understanding i mean a good understanding and then you can you can be, you can do this by the grace of god you will do by the grace of god you will do um but yeah flip it on them so if you want to get onto it you always need to find a way to flip it rather than being on the back foot and saying okay well he is the everlasting father not the father show to them that they've just accepted the fact that there's a possibility of it being Jesus. But now, if there's a possibility and we accept that this is Jesus and Jesus is being called mighty God, you now have no reason to deny the fact that Jesus is being called God. And you can't run away from that, you know? Flip it. Give them, give them what they, they give to you. Let me see if I can find them. Yeah, give as many as you want, girl. If you go to, to Matthew 5:17. Matthew 5, 17, yeah. Um, I have not come to abolish the law, I have come to fulfill it. Yeah. But then afterwards, he says something, heaven and earth will not pass until, like, something... Right, let's get the verse. Nothing going away from it. Do you, do you understand the meaning of fulfill? 
I mean, in the English sense, yes, but maybe not in the so sense. So, a fulfillment of something doesn't mean that it separates or segregate, segregates the, the opposing factor, meaning the Old Testament. It doesn't mean that. It means that it encompasses it in a sense where it pushes it over the line in a way where it it it's the final final countdown in the sense where you've just crossed the line you've run the race you've done your, you've done your 10 mile run right which is the old testament and that 100 meter sprint boom that's the new testament that's the fulfillment you're fulfilling you're fulfilling you're completing it's like a cup you fill a cup if you fill a cup over it flows over that's the fulfillment it so it pushes it over the line. Not so much that it segregates it, it embraces it, but it's saying that this is what we, this is what it always alluded to. It always was pointing towards this. We know this in Jeremiah, where it points towards Jesus being the Word, and all the visions of um, Jesus in the Old Testament being the Word of God in, in the visions. It points towards the Messiah being this divine uh, being. All of these things alluded to the fulfillment which was the New Testament. And if they accept that, brilliant. But if they don't, each their own, I guess. I was, being, I was speaking to somebody who holds views that kind of intersect with Messianic Judaism, right? Because they follow the, like the red letters, but they still, yeah. they still observe kind of, kind of the, the laws of Moses in a sense. For example, not wearing mixed fabrics, dietary laws, stuff like that. Yeah. Is Jesus ever explicitly against the the Lord of Moses. Well, it, but that, that verse we just said, Matthew 5, 17, yeah. that is, the, the, the word literally means to fulfill, <clears throat> to fulfill, which means to embrace it, but to push that over the line. Okay. In Galatians 3.28, if we go to Galatians 3.28, there, no it said, there's no, yeah. yeah, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. Mm -hmm. This is the full embodiment of the New Testament. This shows that when in Jeremiah 31, 31, it says there will be a new covenant, this points towards Galatians 3.28, where it says there will be no, neither Jew nor Gentile. We are all in the body of Christ. So for them to say that we are to continue and to only accept the writings of Jesus, it's, it's heretical. You can't, you can't just segregate Jesus' words and disregard all the others. You need to embody the whole of the Bible within its context. You know, so if we go to Galatians and it shows that we are all one in Christ, but we are there's neither Jew nor Gentile, that then proves to us that we should be following the new covenant, which was which was prophesied in Jeremiah, rather yeah. than the old. Um, so you go to Micah five two. Yeah. This is another Old Testament prophecy. Five two to five three, isn't it? Which it, about the Messiah? Being, yeah. Then it yeah. portrays. The very end it portrays it as being kind of a military leader. Yeah. Yeah, so that, I, I know what you're going to, so yeah. the fact that he's not a military leader shows that he's the false messiah. Maybe the angel of the, angel of the Lord was a military leader. So, this is, the, the Jews heavily, like, interpret it, the Bible, the Bible, the Old Testament specifically, obviously, different, completely different. They got it, they got it wrong in many ways. They, they didn't see that Jesus was the messiah because they didn't, in their hardness of their hearts, they didn't see the fact that he was. This is why Jesus says in um, John 13, 10, I believe, that he had to speak in parables. The reason being is because people couldn't see the, what was in front of them. They can't Nowadays, they can't see what's in front of them. So Jesus wasn't a military leader on earth, but he's a military leader in a sense where he conquers the earth by the, the spread of the church. The church he is the conquer he is the conqueror by the spread of the church he is that military leader that spread the church and established his kingdom that's the christ that we believe yep all good yep he had a few questions glory be to god give it a couple couple years he'll be he'll be out here preaching the gospel i'm sure of it he asked a few questions did you all questions asked yeah they were answered, answered yeah. yeah good glory be to god good knowledge yeah nice one